right, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, before we start, uh, because I just, I love this about our, our area, how many are from Corte Madera? Yeah, Corte Madera, Larkspur, and Greenbrae. Yes, impressive, thank you. So this is the what makes us special and so unique, Corte Madera and Larkspur. We call it the Twin, Twin Cities, the Central Marin. Um, it makes us great because we share our resources and we do things better, uh, both in service delivery and in community. The, the Corte Madera, closer, I'm sorry, okay, the Corte Madera and Larkspur Council, um, council members support us in that venture. And it's one of the requirements and criteria when we problem solve and look at how we provide services to our community. Um, I know our Corte Madera and Larkspur Council members, this was very important to them tonight to be here. Uh, they have a lot of uh, duties and uh, business to attend to tonight, but I do see, I believe, Catherine Way is here from Larkspur. Thank you, Catherine. And those of you that know, uh, disaster preparedness is near and dear to Catherine's heart, and she has uh, supported us on our disaster council as well as staff um, over the years, and so we appreciate that. Uh, Supervisor Radoni couldn't be here, uh, but his assistant is here, uh, Rhonda Cutter. Thank you, Rhonda. And as you know, Supervisor Radoni has been working closely with us. Uh, David Stainbrook and Peter and Marla Orth have been working uh, diligently trying to get support uh, with disaster preparedness trailers. And so it's been a great effort. And we've had a lot of uh, support from the county and Supervisor Radoni uh, with that venture. And we greatly appreciate that. So thank you, Rhonda. <clears throat> So tonight, um, I'm going to do some introductions, and then we're going to turn it over to the team. And it's something that I, I'm, I'm very proud of this team. Um, we touched on it when I started this, uh, this talk. Um, it's the, the consolidations that have taken place recently, the Central Marin Police Authority and the, uh, the, the Central Marin Fire Department. And when we talk about service delivery and what makes us special, it's when you put all your resources together and you really try to problem solve something. Um, and we have a great team. And so I learn something from them every time they speak. I'm excited to hear this, uh, this, uh, this presentation tonight. I haven't uh, heard it yet. Um, and I hope you see the same things I see in our uh, great staff. And so with that, I want to introduce them and kind of give you an overview of what tonight is going to look like. Um, so again, we're here tonight. It's, it's about fire preparedness uh, for our community meeting. And when we talk about fire preparedness, we also know that we're susceptible to the big three right? Flood, earthquake, and fire. But when the fires happened in Sonoma, it hit a lot of us personally, and it's near and dear and close to our hearts. And we have a lot of similarities to some of the things that happened in, in Sonoma County. Um, our NRG groups and our CERT groups, uh, led by, um, had led by the, uh, the Howards, um, they started this and they reached out to us and said, hey, we might want to start doing this either twice a year or annually. Let's get together and talk about this because this is an opportunity where we have momentum to educate ourselves and, and to, to understand how we're set up as a community and how we're set up as a government to handle this. And so this is the first step of hopefully many. Um, I want to thank um, both Casper and Scott there in the back. They're video, videotaping this, uh, this meeting tonight. It'll go up on the Larkspur and Corte Madera websites. And it's something that we can refer to as we move forward. And those of us that couldn't make it uh, can watch this over the next year. Um, okay, so we're going to break this into four parts, and then at the end, we're going to, because it's very important, we know questions and answers are, are very important at the end, and so we'll try to get to that quickly, so I'll stop talking in a second. But we broke it up into four sections. The first is fire. We're going to talk about history, prevention, and response. And with that, we're going to have uh, Chief Scott Schertz, Battalion Chief Matt Cobb, Battalion Chief Dan Reese, and our Fire Marshal Ruben Martin are going to talk about that. Uh, on police, we're going to talk about emergency notifications and evacuation procedures. The police are responsible for evacuations, and Chief Mike Norton and Captain Hami clearly are here to talk about that. I also want to point out that our press information officer, Margot Robacher, she's really built our social media platform in both public safety with Central Marin Police and with Corte Madero and Larkspur. We've really followed her model, and she's here tonight, and we're very lucky to have her. Thank you, Margot. Next, we couldn't do this without Marin County, and we have uh, Marin County OAS is here, and tonight we have, we're lucky enough to have Tom Jordan. And Tom Jordan's gonna talk about um, 
one of the big conversation pieces, right? It's, it's the, our emergency notification capabilities. And tonight we're gonna talk about those capabilities and then we're gonna talk about education because it's important that we educate ourselves tonight on to make sure that we're registered and up to date so we get those notifications because there's multiple platforms. And the second piece is to educate our friends and neighbors in our community because it's, it's, it's key. One thing that I, I don't want tonight to be about, but I want to ensure you that is an absolute priority for both the town of Corte Madera and the, and the city of Larkspur to evaluate any possible tool in the toolbox for notifications. So we're gonna talk about what we have in place tonight, but I want to ensure you, and it's fine in the question and answer period to ask about it, but I wanna tell you that I've personally taken the lead to look at all capabilities, and one of them is the siren. Both Corte Madera and Larkspur had a siren um, in the past, there's pros and cons of why those siren systems are not in place today, uh, but moving forward, it is a tool in the toolbox. And, and, and what we're evaluating the siren for potentially is as a redundancy to what we have in place. And you'll hear what we have in place today, but moving forward, that redundancy has to work. One of the problems we have right now is if you activate a siren in Corte Madera, Larkspur has to have that siren too, because we're completely merged operationally in a disaster preparedness situation. And with that, we both have to have it. Secondly, if you activate, if you have a fire, the first five minutes are probably the most critical, would we all agree? And when you activate it, someone has to be there to push that button. And 50 to 60% of the time, when we look back at the last 20 years of our siren system, no one's there to push the button because the button is in the fire department and the fire department is going to the fire. And so we look at, you know, we don't have personnel at various locations on our town 24 seven, right? And so it's not a reason why we don't have a siren. We have to come up with technology and a plan to make sure that 100% of the time we are in a position to activate that siren when it's necessary in the first critical minutes of any incident. And so it's not a reason why we don't have it. It's, it's to say what technology is out there. Can we activate it from a remote location? Um, can we staff accordingly in a procedure where we know that's going to work? Um, and so there's a lot of op op opportunities for us. And I just want you to know, we know it's one of the priorities of our community to vet and report out to our community. And I want you to know that starts and stops with me. And that's what I am going to be doing as we move forward um, with that. So I wanna ensure you it's something we're looking at. Um, and lastly, um, and, and Peter and Marla Orth uh, talked a lot about this with us of, you know, we talk about disaster preparedness and how we should prepare um, on any incident and we forget about the animals. And so um, we have the Marin Humane Society here and she's one of my favorite people. It's uh, Captain Cindy Machado's here. And so uh, we spent some time last week on the uh, coyotes and uh, this week we're gonna talk about um, preparedness. I think you'll like this meeting better, Cindy. But <laughs> <I like laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna get started. I want you to know this is videotaped again. So again, it'll go on the websites. Also in Corte Madera and Larkspur, we have a very detailed disaster preparedness um, site on our websites. It has everything. It's regionally, locally within the county, and specific to Corte Madera and Larkspur. Please go to it. Um, it's, it's very educational, and um, I think um, it'll meet your needs. Um, and lastly, I just want to, um, sorry guys, but it, it's just important because it's our team. I want to uh, thank uh, Chief Mark Pomey for being here from Kenfield Fire, and it just goes to show... Uh, the support we have uh, within our region. And so thank you for being here. Okay, and again, if I didn't introduce myself, I'm sorry, my name's Todd Cusimano. Uh, it's not about me, uh, it's about everyone else, right? Uh, but my name's Todd Cusimano, I'm the town manager uh, for Corte Madera. Uh, Dan Schwartz couldn't make it tonight, but this was very important to him. I want you to know that. Um, and so we do everything together when it comes to, to the safety of our communities. And so um, with that, I wanna turn it over to Chief uh, Schertz and we'll get started. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, this is very encouraging to us to see the community be so involved. Um, I just wanna take a brief moment to introduce myself and I'd like to get to know as many of you as possible. My name is Scott Schertz. Um, I'm wrapping up my 26th year with um, Larkspur and Corte Madera. Um, I am now the chief of the Central Marin Fire Department, which we are just wrapping up, putting the finishing touches on our consolidation. Um, we've improved our, uh, our department greatly by merging, much more efficient, much more uh, operationally capable. And um, we've assembled a really great panel of uh, expert subject 
matter experts, and I know there's a lot of information to get through, um, but I just want to let you know I was born and raised in uh, Larkspur, and I have either been living or working in Larkspur and Cordomadera for my entire life, so I have a uh, kind of a special uh, commitment to the community, and I'm really honored to be your fire chief, and uh, let's get rolling because we're supposed to be wrapping this up by 7.30. Uh, next up is Matt, Klopp, Matt Cobb. He's a battalion chief, and he's going to give you a quick uh, background and overview of how we got here and where we're headed. Hi. How's the volume? Can everybody hear me okay? In the back? Okay. Uh, my name is Matt Cobb. I'm one of the battalion chiefs in Central Marin. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about, again, a brief local history. We're going to talk about how our agencies work together, working together more and more, and that not only includes uh, the Larkspur and Coordinator Fire Departments becoming Central Marin, but also includes how well we work with the Police Department, the Humane Society, with OES, all of our partners in emergency services. Um, Marin does have a, a mutual aid plan and a plan in place that's not new since Sonoma. It's been in place for a long time and constantly evolving. We'll talk about that. Um, Dan Reese is the battalion chief in charge of community services and emergency medical services. He's going to come up and talk about how you can help get your family together, get prepared in the case of not just a fire emergency, but all emergencies. Um, we'll talk about emergency notifications and how those occur and how those are continuing to evolve and uh, how you take care of your community, how you take care of yourselves. And then again, at the end, I know that everyone came with questions and that's exactly what we want. At the end, uh, we'll field all the questions that you like, but hopefully we can answer some of those during the presentation. Uh, the history. Uh, the picture here is of actually the 1929 Mill Valley fire. Um, but we'll talk about Mount Tamalpais, and it, it's no news flash that it is fuel loaded. It indeed has a great amount of fuel on it. Um, it kind of burned routinely up through the 20s and into the 30s became protected and it didn't burn much after that. Uh, you can see uh, these are the uh, firefighters here in 1929 in Mill Valley doing an evacuation of their own, essentially. It looks like they may have bit off a little more than they can chew. Um, and we'll talk about how, we, how we've advanced much beyond uh, the uh, shovels and the overalls in our fire services. You know, the community has evolved here as summer cabins uh, for San Francisco. Uh, actually, I would go uh, quite often on uh, one patient that we had who lived, uh, he came to Larkspur in a horse-drawn carriage with his parents, and he lived his entire time in the hillsides of Larkspur uh, in what was uh, then actually the family chicken coop. Now, as generations have changed, that small chicken coop has become a large house. We've seen that everywhere. These small cabins have become large houses. Um, but to get access to those houses, we just essentially paved over the horse trails those small horse trails, and those didn't change much. So now we have a lot of large houses in the narrow streets that you're all familiar with. So we'll talk about some of the ordinances when the fire marshal comes up and what we've done to improve our access in there for you. Um, Oakland Hills Fire, uh, most of you probably remember that. That was my first large fire. Uh, I've been working here for about a year, and I went over the Oakland Hills Fire, and that's really what was a genesis for a lot of the ordinances we have now, and a lot of things that Ruben's going to talk to you about. And we didn't just, after the Oakland Hills fire, start thinking about evacuations, fire safety ordinances, and, and stop then in 1991, 92, directly after the fire. We've continued to devolve those things to keep you safe. And Ruben's going to speak to you a lot about that. Um, and then one thing about back then, it was the Twin Cities Police Department and the Larkspur and Quarterman Era Fire Departments, who have all evolved into now, it's the Central Marin Police and Central Marin Fire, have a, a long history of working together. And actually, we were... Some of the first, the police department was some of the first to come up with the concept of that uh, the fire department's going to be busy in the event of a large fire so that the police department can go forth and help with evacuations. And, you know, as all new ideas seem to be, we thought it was a little crazy, but we started to drill on this and work on this and it, and it worked great. So we've been doing this for quite some time. Is that my phone? I don't think so. It is not. It is not. Um. So we have a, a close working relationship with the police department, and uh, we've been working together for quite some time. Uh, with that, um, you know, I have to say, just on a side note, as far as the relationship goes, I've worked around in different areas and seen a lot of different things, and, and we have the nicest police officers, and we have a really great working relationship. And so it's nice, you know, because you go around, you see other communities, and the relationship is not that strong. 
Um, one important thing to when you talk about the close working relationship is we do a lot of things together. And if you're ever wondering who is better at softball, it's statistically, and when I say statistically, 100%, it's the fire department. So clearly when we get a large incident, we're not going to handle it with, with our stations here, although we've improved our capabilities quite a bit. Uh, we have a countywide mutual aid plan that is in place. We have a dispatch computer that is located in San Rafael that, and dispatchers, and we have a plan pre-established for moving engines, not only up from the rest of the county to us, but from outside the county in. That reflects our state mutual aid plan. We bring engines in from all over the state. We saw this in Sonoma. Uh, now we're reciprocating currently Marin has 15 engines down in Southern California helping them with their fires right now What does that mean to your service? You don't you don't miss a blip of your service because as soon as the engines go Firefighters come in and backfill the station. So your service here remains exactly the same all the time So pre-planning uh, obviously we have to pre-plan for the eventuality of an emergency and we've been doing this for quite some time Dan's going to talk to you a little about the MTZ plan later on but those pre-plans aren't established once and then put on a shelf and done. We're constantly evolving them. We, we drill continually on our pre-plans and we do large scale drills usually every spring on our pre-plans. So they're constantly evolving and we're glad that you're all here because you can start learning a little more about it. But as far as pre-planning, don't let this be the end of your pre-planning. Find us, talk to us, talk to our fire marshal, talk to our battalion chiefs, talk to our crews because we have so much information that we're trying to condense into this program that we really, there's so much more we want to tell you. So please, please reach out, reach out to your neighborhood groups. Training, uh, Chief Shirts was instrumental in establishing what they call the Central Marin Training Consortium, which is all of the fire departments in the region right here, all train with each other, have the same hose loads, have the same equipment, we all work with each other. So we're way ahead on getting to know our neighbors and training with our neighbors. Um, Central Marine Fire was established. And one great thing is about that is now we're able to have dedicated battalion chiefs who provide command and control for starting evacuations, command and control of a fire that might, or another emergency that may occur here, literally housed two blocks up the street here, no longer coming in from somewhere else. So our command and control is local, it's here and their people in your community. Uh, we had one wildland firefighting engine prior to this. Uh, because of our consolidation, we're now able to have two. So we always, no matter what happens anywhere in the state, one of our wildland engines, the ones that are small with the four wheel drive and the wheelbase to get up into the mountain and get into the narrow streets easily uh, is always here in town. So we always have in our operational area, one of our wildland engines is always here for you now. Shared services. We share personnel through other agencies because uh, it helps in efficiencies, it helps providing a, a larger platform, but what else it does is that we know the firefighters from other agencies, not just because we've seen them and they look familiar, but because we've actually worked with them on their engines. So we change personnel back and forth between the engines when it is needed. And what that does, it's done is give us a great working relationship with those other agencies, because not only we know the people on paper, but we know them personally. Uh, technology, talk a lot about technology. OES has incredible technology, uh, and we're always pursuing technology and that technology to, to give every advantage to you. We're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight, but, and we live next to Silicon Valley, so that the technological mecca of the world. And so, we have and embrace technology and we're very happy to bring that to you. What's going to come up next in a second here, I'm going to introduce Dan Reese, the MTZ. What is the MTZ? It's the Mutual Threat Zone. But before that, uh, when disasters happen, I was uh, you get all these sound bites on the news. And I was really impressed uh, by a lot of them. But one of them that really struck me was uh, they had shown an area where the houses had all burned down in a community. And... One of the homeowners said that he lived there for five years and didn't know any of his neighbors, but they've all come together as a community since the fire. So I would encourage all of you to come together every community early on. Know your neighbors, know who's down the street, and know who you can help. Because as soon as you are a community and work together and, and know your neighbors, the better off we're all going to be. Next up is Dan Reese.
Yes. Can you hear me okay? Like I said, my name is Dan Reese. I'm a battalion chief with the Central Marine Fire Department. And one of my main responsibilities as a battalion chief is disaster preparedness and working with the community with disaster plans. Most of what we've done with disaster preparedness has been revolved around earthquakes and floods. And we're just starting to get more involved with the community with developing what the citizens can do in a wildfire situation. It's significantly different than an earthquake. An earthquake uh, happens. It's a static situation, it's, it's one and done, and then we all go into help. Wildfires are moving constantly and they change locations. So it is, makes it more difficult for us to train citizens in what to do in a wildfire situation because it's not like an earthquake where it just happens and we tell you to go to work. There are different areas that need, need help, evacuations and so forth. So um, we are learning more and more how to deal with um, the citizens and what CERT groups and NRG groups can do in a wildfire because we haven't typically used them a lot in a wildfire situation. One thing I want to talk about that's really important to you is that we keep telling you you should have a plan. You should go to um, readyforwildfire.org and develop a personal wildfire action plan. And that's all good and handy. And you're wondering, well, what have you done? Fire service, what have you, you're asking us, what have you done? To, so we're prepared for the situation. And um, Coming from a lot of problems that occurred in the Oakland Hills fire and some other large uh, fires throughout the state, we started in early 2000 developing what we call the Mutual Threat Zone Plan, the MGZ plan. And what that does, it's a countywide plan that discusses uh, evacuation procedures, it talks about communication plans, it talks about um, what the incident commander will do in the first 10 minutes of a big uh, wildfire when it's, when it's developing. The, t the term mutual came from... In a lot of our wildfire areas, we have what's called local response areas around your communities, and then you get up in the hills and it's state responsibility area. And when these large fires occur, they come into both those areas, so we call it a mutual threat zone. What this does is it allows the incident commander in the first 10 minutes of a wildfire to not have to worry about what radio frequencies he's going to use, what are his evacuation centers, what are his evacuation routes. All this stuff is predetermined in the uh, mutual threat zone plan. Got my glasses here, of course. <clears throat> so one thing it, it develops is a, what's called is the communication plan. And for you people, you don't really care what type of radios we're using, what radio frequencies we're using. What you want to know is do you have a plan to communicate with all the fire engines and fire apparatus throughout the state of California? And the answer to that is yes. Every single fire engine, every water tender, every utility vehicle, every ambulance, all emergency vehicles, that fire department vehicles, that participate in the mutual aid system throughout the state of California, all have the same radios installed. And they all have the same radio plan. And every spring, we update that radio plan so we can communicate. When we go down to Los Angeles, we can communicate right away with the incident commander. When the engines from Sonoma County come down here, they can talk to our engines. So I want you to be assured that through this plan, we will have ability to communicate with other responding fire engines and so forth. That was one of the biggest problems in the Oakland Hills fire was communications. And that, that through, that, through that, that incident, we've learned there are uh, better ways to do it. <clears throat> Another thing that the, um, in the uh, MTZ plan does is it talks about um, pre-designated um, evacuation centers. And it talks about pre-designated uh, incident bases. And like, so for a large fire within Marin County, we would use a Marin County Civic Center as the incident base where all the uh, fire engines would meet up and then get sent out from there. It also has pre-designated incident, um, incident base plans or the incident command post. And we have set up Mill Valley Fire Station 7. And we have uh, established Kentfield Fire Department as what the primary incident base or command post base would be in a large incident um, in Marin County. A lot of it, again, depends on what area of Marin the fire is in. We can't always say evacuate to this particular center or evacuate to this particular place because that place might be directly um, involved with the fire and so forth. In Corte Madera, you know, we've always had these um, evacuation centers and we've, we've called the rec center one and the Hillside Church on the east side has been an uh, evacuation center. But in a wildfire situation, Neither of those are a really good places to do it. So we would recommend that, depending again on, on the, where the fire is, Redwood High School and Tamil Pius High School in Mill Valley would be your primary, primary shelter place for the citizens to go to. We don't 
set up shelters. That's the responsibility of the Red Cross. And the Red Cross has lots of trained people on setting up shelters. And you're encouraged to contact the Red Cross if you need more information about shelter deployment. And if you want to be a shelter volunteer, there are specific classes that you can take to become a, um, a become a assist with the with the with the shelters and so so forth. But again, the fire department doesn't typically um, open up shelters uh, in a wildfire situation. Again, in the in the earthquake situation, that's a different story. But the wildfire, depending on where it is and what direction it's going, you may be instructed to go to a different location. But but on our pre-designated areas for Cordon Bleu and Larkspur, the Tamil Pius High School and Redwood High School would be your main shelter. Uh, location to, to report to. One of the really most really nice, nice features about the MTZ plan is that we have designated maps of everywhere in Marin County and it develops, it, it, the maps um, break it down by neighborhoods for what we call structure protection areas. And an example, I know that's not a very good example, I'll leave some on the table you can re review afterwards, but <clears throat> I don't know how well you can see this, but this one particularly is for the Ring Mountain area. And see how it's color coded, and in the color coding is uh, structure protection zones that we have pre-designated. So if we need to send out a message as far as evacuation goes, we have predetermined areas of where these evacuation notices would go to. Thank you. <clears throat> Part of the, um, hang on a second here. Another important factor when the um, MTZ plan gets activated by the incident commander, it automatically includes notifications to a number of agencies, the Marin County Sheriff's Department, the Marin County OES, Humane Society, um, uh, public information people, media people, and um, our local utility companies. Because the local utility companies in a large wildfire can actually play an important role in assisting us with power shut off to certain areas, and gas shut off to certain areas. The utility company has the ability to turn off gas to entire neighborhoods in a large disaster, which can help prevent or spread of the wildfire. So I want you to be assured that we have been working on this plan for, like I say, since the early 2000s. It was started, it, was, it actually was developed in 2005. And I want you to be assured that we have plans in place for your neighborhoods for evacuation procedures and notification procedures. All right? What can you do? Again, if you go to the readyforwildfire.org, it has in the back of that website, it has what's called a personal wildfire action plan. And that gives in great detail of what you need to do to prepare yourself for a wildfire. It'll talk about fuel in your car, preparing documents, um, critically knowing your routes out, what's your escape route. We have sort of designated primary and, and secondary escape routes. But again, that so is dependent on where the fire is and where the fire might be heading to. So we would want you to know within your neighborhoods, in, in an area like Christmas Tree Hill, that has all sorts of paths up and down that hill. Know those paths because you may not be able to evacuate by car. I was involved in a situation in Los Angeles a number of years ago where our, our escape route was blocked by a truck that collided with a telephone pole. And we spent a long time going to get this truck out of the way so we could get the fire trucks back out of the area. So know your routes. You may not be able to go by car. It may be a walking situation. Have your kit, your go bag kit, it's called. And in that, in that wildfire action plan, we'll talk about what you need to have within that kit. Have a family contact. Have a meeting area. Again, Redwood High School and Tim Pius High School would be the best bets for uh, to meet up with people in an evacuation place because we have decided that town center here, I mean town park area, would be a staging area for fire apparatus and a large incident within Cornwall or Oxford. So going to the rec center may not be the best place because there's going to be a lot of fire trucks there staging. So we want you to be away from that area. Going to community groups like this. I mean, you people, by showing up today here, it's like one of the first steps you can do to really get yourself prepared for a wildfire because it is, right now, it's in the top of everybody's mind. We thought this meeting was kind of generated what happened up in Santa Rosa, Sonoma County, but right now it's happening down south in Los Angeles. So it's uh, it is in the top of everybody's mind. Be ready for warnings. When we give the evacuation warning, we really want you to take heed on that and to get out quickly and not waste time and not think, well, maybe I'll stand around and see if I can help the firefighters or maybe I'll stay to the last minute hosing down my roof. And you, you see this on the news all the time. People trying to fight fire with a quarter-inch garden hose, and it, it may occasionally be effective, 
but more often than not, it disrupts what we're trying to do, and then it takes away from what we, we might have to help that person if something happens with them. So we would really rather you have a plan and to get out and not to try and fight a wildfire with, your, with, um, with a garden hose. Know that there are, um, if there was a warning system that could tell us, you know what, in 48 hours there's likely to be a large earthquake, we would go, well, that's a great system. Well, we have that system for wildfires, and it's called the red flag warning. And I often get questions from people that live in what we call wildland inter urban interfaces, critical fire areas. Well, what does a red flag mean? And how do I find out about it? So this is a crit If you live in a wildland inter interface, and really almost anywhere in Marin County, because there are areas like we saw in Coffee Park in Santa Rosa that were not quite in the inner wildland interface. This was neighborhoods that were, you know, three miles from the from the big hills and stuff, and embers were tossed, you know, miles and miles and burned down neighborhoods. So know what a red flag warning means. There are red flag warnings and the red flag watches, and these are all broadcast on the news, on, on weather broadcast, and on most um, weather apps will tell you when there's a red flag warning. A red flag warning for us means if a fire starts, it's likely to spread real rapidly, more than our initial resources can get a contain of, and so we have to start thinking about ordering more resources right away. What a red flag warning for you means, if it's you know in 12 hours, 24 hours, that there's a, going to be a critical day where if a fire starts, it's going to grow rapidly, you start thinking about your escape routes, you start thinking about what have I done to prepare myself, and you maybe encourage neighbors you might see doing things that create sparks, uh, somebody with a, uh, a chainsaw or a, um, a weed whacker or mowing the lawn, all those kind of things on a red flag day, anything that could cause a spark could cause a wildfire to ignite quicker and grow rapidly. So these are things that if you know it's a red flag day, have your, your plan and have, tell your neighbors if you see them doing things that may not be the best idea on that day to, uh, to do that. Prepare your home. This is um, just a gigantic thing I'm going to let uh, Fire Marshal Rubin talk a little bit about. But getting your home ready for a wildfire so when it does approach it, it might have a better chance of survivability. Sometimes Mother Nature just does her thing and there's not a lot we can do. I mean, you see that in Los Angeles. You've got two of the largest departments in the state, in the, in the country, very well prepared, Los Angeles City, Los Angeles County Fire, and they still lose homes. So sometimes, based on the wind and certain fire conditions, there's not a lot we can do and it's just going to happen. But once it says over with and the fire starts, the progression starts to slow down, there are neighborhoods that are saved by how they've done prepare for your home. You see on some of these hillsides, four or five houses burnt, two saved. Four or five houses burnt, a couple saved. And a lot of that has to do with what the person did to prepare their home for the wildfire. That's all I've got. I hope that's enough. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Reuben Martin, and I'm your local fire marshal. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is what we can do as homeowners to prepare our house and our neighbor's houses and our communities in case we do have a wildfire. And when we talk about defensible space, what we're talking about is in the fire service, our bread and butter, everyday fire, if there's such a thing. And what we're talking about maybe is one to two acres able to be extinguished with the initial responses. That's what we're trying to prevent, trying to prevent that one to two acres in becoming 50 acres. And by doing defensible space, that's how we prevent that. So what affects a wildfire? So in the fire service, we always call it the fire triangle. There's three legs of it, or the tripod, whatever you want to call it. Um, one is your weather. It's your most variable. And when I mean variable, it means, like Dan explained, it's the wind factor. The wind drives what we do and what we can't do with a wildfire. And then he mentioned red flag days. Pay attention to when a red flag day is available coming around because that's when you start putting your plan into place. Topography, the lay of the land, our slopes, our hillsides. There's not a lot we can do with these first two legs of the fire triangle. They are what they are. We have no influence over them. What we do have influence over is the fuel. And when I talk about fuel, I'm talking about the natural vegetation, the hillsides, the open space, those what we call transition zones, that zone between 
your backyard, and maybe if you're up into open space. That's that transition zone of the fuels. We're also talking about your landscaping. What type of landscaping are you putting in your yards? Is it flammable? We call it pyrophytic or highly flammable plants. Um, take a look at that. Some of them are juniper, bamboo. Bamboo is a grass species that can grow 10, 15 feet tall. And we want to be careful with that because all the dead fuel loading that's within it. Um, and then your homes. People don't realize that our homes are also a fuel model because now we have all the plastics, everything in it, your vehicle, the siding that you decide to use. When you remodel your house, what type of materials are we using? Are we using um, building materials that are resistive to fire? Or are we putting sh shingles back on our house? So some of those things we need to look at. You know, what type of, of roofing do we have on our house? Is it fire resistive or do we still have wood shingle on our house. Let's start thinking about long-term plan on getting those out of there and putting them more with your class A fire resistive material. So what's the law say? So under the California Public Resource Code states uh, section 4291 that anyone who owns, leases, or controls lands within a wildland urban interface area, meaning if you have a house, you're renting a house, or you have an undeveloped parcel, you're required to maintain defensible space. And what we're talking about defensible space, we're talking about 100 feet from your house. Meaning wherever your building is, we want defensible space 100 feet. So what does that mean? Yeah, some of our yards aren't 100 feet. So you go to your property line, then your neighbor does their defensible space. And between both of you, you create that 100 foot buffer between each other. So what is defensible space again? It's that area around your house that can be affected by an oncoming wildfire. And it, if you have adequate defensible space, it may be that last ditch effort if the fire is moving so fast that you may have to take temporary refuge within your house until the firestorm blows through, or the firefighters that are there protecting your house may find themselves in a situation where they need a safety zone temporarily to take refuge as well, because we look at that as a safe working area. And it's also, um, defensible space is also that area that minimizes the extent of a small fire growing or potentially growing larger into a firestorm. So here we're going to talk a little bit about fuel reduction zones. Um, we break them down into three. One is your house. Zone two is from zero to 30. And then the final zone is 30 to 100 feet. So your home, number one, your address. Can we see your address? Can we find you? You know, you want numbers that are reflect, if not necessarily reflective, but the opposite color of whatever the wall posting on. So don't put bronze address numbers on a wooden post because that's difficult to see. If you possibly can, you'd want to have lighted or backlit numbers. That way we can find you not only in a fire, but in a regular everyday emergency medical aid. You know, can we find you at night? You know, you want to clean all the pine needles off your roof during the summertime in your roof gutters because that's where an ember may land and actually cause you to, uh, your house to catch fire. You know, you want to install chimney or spark arresters if you're still using wood-burning stoves. You don't want an ember to come out of your fireplace and chimney and get out into the wildland urban interface and start a fire. And then remove any tree limbs that are usually within six feet of your roof line or six to 10 feet of your um, chimney spark arrestor because the last thing you want is a potentially chimney fire and then potentially catching that tree on fire, and then now we've got a wildfire. And then now your uh, zones from zero to 30 feet is what we just think about lean, clean, and green. Meaning you wanna thin out some of the vegetation, get rid of about anything that's um, dead, any uh, pyrophytic plants. This is the places where you want your demonstration gardens. Everything is irrigated, your plants, your flowers, and so forth. 
You want to remove all dead plants and grasses and weeds within that 30 foot zone. And you want to, when you're planning your landscaping, you want to properly space it in a sense to where you're not creating this giant wall of fuel that will carry the fire from point A to point B. And then remove all tree limbs that are within six feet that overhang your roof line or within 10 feet of your spark arrestor. Once again, we're trying to prevent a fire from getting from the ground into the tree canopy into your house or vice versa. If you have a house fire, we want to keep it out of the wildland environment. So it goes both ways. And then trees on the ground. Um, some of you may have heard the term ladder fuels. And if you think about a step stool, the bottom rung of that ladder or the first step is your grasses. The second step may be some brushes or um, maybe some scotch broom that didn't get removed. And then the next level would be some low-hanging tree branches of a pine tree that you haven't had an opportunity to limb up yet. So that creates that ladder. You get a spark or something that starts a fire on the ground. It'll quickly move to the brush, quickly remove that trees, and then potentially into your house. So what we want to see is on all mature trees, try to limb them up, get all the branches that are less than two inches up off the ground. And so you want to basically skirt the bottom of your trees. And just think about a tree limb less than two inches. You can probably use that as kindling to start your fireplace or if you're out camping. Use anything more than that. Um, it'll take a little longer to start. And then remove all dead foliage from the trees. You may have a pine tree. You may have a bay tree with a lot of dead wood within it. You want to remove that as well because that also becomes a hazard. And then, of course, remove all flammable plants, scotch broom, uh, juniper, and so forth within it. And then your fuel zones between 30 and 100 feet, that's where you want to start doing the natural vegetation uh, fuel modification if you're fortunate enough to have some property um, on your parcel. And this is where you want to keep your uh, grasses cut below three inches, remove all dead foliage from your trees. Once again, you want to skirt up your trees, get them off the ground. That way we can prevent a fire from getting up into the can. And if we have any dead brush piles from previous trimmings, you want to try to remove those because what we call those in the fire service is jackpots of fuel. You know, it'll come into, or a bonfire. It'll become a bonfire in your yard eventually if a fire comes through there. And then some tree removal may be necessary. You may have some eucalyptus on your property that you may want to have removed for overall fire safety, not only for yourself, but for the entire community. You may have some pine trees that may be somewhat diseased, you know, with some dead foliage in it. You may want to start thinking about removing those trees. And then one other thing is your roadway clearances. Um, we have some very narrow roadways here within our community. And it's difficult in your own personal vehicle coming up and down with opposing traffic. Now you can imagine us with a 40,000 pound vehicle, fire engine trying to get up there. In an emergency, lights and sirens, you're panicking trying to get out. We're in a hurry trying to get there to keep the fire from getting any bigger. So what you wanna do is try to look at your roadways. Look where you're parking. Are you leaving enough access for the fire engines to come by? Um, are you along your frontage property, are you removing all the dead foliage and grasses along your roadside? Because that may be your escape route when the fire comes. You're gonna need that route coming out. So if it's overgrown with trees, brush, um, flammable vegetation, that may hinder you leaving and us entering. So what we usually say is we want 15 feet of clearance through roadways, that way we're not hitting the top of our engines, breaking windshields, breaking light bars, um, potentially limbs falling over the roadway. And then along the sides of the roadway, we want to look at um, 10 feet over and 10 feet up. And that's meaning you're removing all the flammable vegetation, usually 10 feet off the roadway. And the reason because that is, what if someone decides to park their vehicle's hot, drops a spark or something, then the grass on the side of the roadway catches fire, and then here we go. So if we can keep that to a minimum, That'd be great. And so what does this mean? A lot of the questions I get is, 100 feet of defensible space, do I need to clear cut my entire property? Oh my God, I'm not gonna have anything left. That's not the intent. 
The intent is what I like to call is to have curb appeal, or even better yet, your park-like setting. For your, for your, and I've given some examples. Here's a home that's in a mountainous environment. They've done defensible space. They still have the trees. They still have screening. But yet they have adequate defensible space around the property. Here's another one on a hillside in a redwood forest. You know, Mount Tam is a forest. That's where we live. And so is it possible to create defensible space in a forest? Absolutely. Look what they've done around the property. They've created that defensible space, but yet they still have their trees. So if a fire started there, at least we'd be able to keep it, you know, manageable within those one to two acres if possible. And then here's another example of what someone's property looked like before they did work. And this looks familiar to a lot of places we drive around. And with some sweat and work, this is what they were able to achieve with it. So, right there. From that to that. Yes, it's a lot of work, but it's possible. We can all do this. And when I say we, it's us as a community, is we need to um, figure out what we need to do to keep our homes safe, as well as our neighbors' homes safe, and our community safe. So we all know um, maybe one or two properties within our neighborhood that's always overgrown. Maybe it may be a person who is, um, doesn't have the resources to clean it, maybe elderly maybe disabled. And that, those are the people that we need to identify as a community where we need to come together and maybe have a work group and come out and help that person. You know, not only that, we're getting to know them as neighbors before the emergency, but we're also creating a safe area for ourselves. And one of the big things that I got from Sonoma County, um, from friends of mine who lost their places up there, is neighbors helping neighbors. And so, like Dan mentioned, in this community room, we're getting to know each other before the emergency. Because I can guarantee we're all going to know each other after the emergency. So we want to be able to try to do that and rely on each other. So if we do have to evacuate, we know where we're going. And so here's some of the resources for you that you may have. Alert Marin is um, where you're going to get your emergency communication information. Fire Safe Moran is a nonprofit organization. Um, we have a representative, Todd Lando, in the back that's here to talk with you afterwards if you need to. But they're a great resource for um, finding out about defensible space, finding out about um, how to get ready before an emergency. If you're planning on um, doing any kind of type of landscaping, you can always vet whatever you're going to put through through their website. They'll be able to tell you what's flammable, what's ex what should be planted, what shouldn't be planted, and so forth. And then uh, Firewise Communities is a program sponsored by the National Fire Protection Agency or Association, which is NFPA, which is a nationally recognized, um, it does uh, standards nationally. And so what they do is they create and Todd be able to talk about this a little better, but Firewise Communities, you're able to come together as a community to create um, defensible space by both um, building standards and the plants you use, and you'd be able to get certified as a community to become Firewise and you become recognized. Mill Valley is a Firewise community. They have some. Sleepy Hollow is a Firewise community. Novato has several Firewise communities. So as you come together as a neighborhood and create your entire neighborhood as a Firewise community. It not only benefits you, but it benefits the rest of the community. And then also readyforwildfire.org. And that's a good website that's sponsored by Cal Fire, and it's real easy to maneuver. And it talks about having a plan to get ready, put that plan into place, and then put it in action when the fire comes. With that, I will pass it over to Chief Norton. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Norton, and I am your police chief if you live in Larkspur, Corte Madera, Green Bay, or San Anselmo. 
Is there any San Anselmo residents here? Show hands. Nice. Thank you for coming. Um, I wanted to start off by just saying I learned a lot during the uh, the fires uh, segment. And they surprisingly did a good job. I never give them compliments, but why don't we give them one more hand for doing a good job? That that's about the first and last time I'll ever compliment the fire department. Um, I do have one shameless plug before I go. I don't know where Margot is, but she'd be mad at me if I didn't plug this. Um, do we, I know there's at least two people here who took our Citizen Police Academy last year. Can I see a show of hands? One, just two. Okay. Um, that's Phyllis and Lucinda. We have another session coming February to April. We do this once a year. If you're interested, um, there's some flyers just like this on our table, or you can talk to Phyllis or Lucinda. I know they both really enjoyed it. Um, it's a great experience. Does the fire department do any sort of like, citizen academy? So we are 100% better at the citizen academy than the fire department. Um, also, as I go along, I'm going to, we're running a little long, so I'm going to go quick. The main point is going to be, we're going to be talking about notifications. And I know Tom Jordan with OES is also going to hit on this, but we have, um, handouts that pretty much cover and summarize everything I'll be talking about. So if I go too fast, grab one on our table, or you can go to our website and our very front page, it's listed right in the middle. It's centralmarinepolice.org. Just Google Central Marin Police if you forget that. It pops right up and there's hyperlinks on the website to sign up for everything I'll be talking about. So with that, yeah, they, they might have like plastic red helmets and stickers, but, um, so very first, what do we do? What do our primary focus is police and fire is life saving whenever there's a big fire or even a, a fire in just a kitchen. Um, we work with the fire department in establishing evacuation areas and road closures. If it is going to be a substantial fire and we begin notifications and evacuations side by side with the fire and depending on how big it is with the assistance of Marin OES. And we also coordinate mutual aid response for road closures. So what that means is if there's a substantial fire in Corte Madero or Larkspur, and let's say it's happening in the middle of the night, realistically, we may have anywhere from five to six police officers at Central Marin Police. That's it. Um, and those of you that have been following the fires in Los Angeles or up in uh, Santa Rosa or Sonoma County and Napa, you know it takes an army to notify and evacuate communities. We rely heavily on all the other law enforcement in our county, and they rely on us, and that includes CHP and the sheriff. When something big happens, we're kind of one big law enforcement department. So that's the way to think about us. Um, before we play this video, I wanted to show you, I don't think the sound works, unfortunately, and the sound is just, as, oh, it is. Okay, great. Um, this is from the Tubbs fire that just happened a few months ago, and that was the fire that was mainly Santa Rosa. But before we play it, um, I want to say in my 16 years working in Central Marin and Twin Cities, um, the fire, I've been on a lot of fires with the fire department, and most of them have been a fire in the kitchen. It might be small, it might be big. Occasionally, I've been on a few that took out a whole house or a building, very rarely. But I'm, I don't think I've ever been on a fire that maybe it didn't affect one or two structures. And in those, to be honest with you, they're really, the notification's easy. We don't use social media. We don't need to call you. We literally, one or two officers showing up can go knock on a few doors. We have time to help you leave. We have all really all the time in the world. The fire department's fighting the fire. They're um, taking care of that. And it's and then we're kind of you know closing the road down and helping as needed. It's I've done them by myself. It's pretty simple. But what we're everyone's concerned about and what we're talking about are these really scary firestorms that Los Angeles is dealing with now and that uh, we just went through up in Sonoma County. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen video. This is actually a body cam, which we wear um, from a sheriff's deputy that night. Um, the fire maybe doesn't look that close, but I want you to pay attention to the smoke in the air, the ash falling, and you can actually see it glowing in the distance. And remember that this fire at one point, I believe was moving about 20 miles an hour. So think about that. And it's leapfrogging. It's not just a wall of flames, but that's how fast it's going. And Sonoma County Sheriff's a big agency. Santa Rosa Police is big. Um, but the point of showing this is this is one deputy going to a house and the resident here is really lucky. 
because there's two of them and they're elderly and one's unable to walk and he's able to actually evacuate these residents. But there's other residents who didn't get that knock on the door because of the speed of this fire. And we'll talk about um, not waiting for us to knock on the door to evacuate. We'll talk about how in a big fire, that's just really not realistic, regardless of how many law enforcement you have, but some other options and things we do. So um, go ahead and play this. We'll let it run for about a minute and a half, two minutes. Sheriff's Office! Sheriff's Office! So I didn't do that to scare you, but um, it's scary, isn't it? Um, I think there was that one shot when he's walking on the deck and it's pretty much the whole horizon's on fire. And even though that's, you can tell that's considerably far away, the, the wind and the ash and the smoke is incredibly heavy. And that resident, I think that was a neighbor helping the uh, deputy. And that's another reason I like this video is if you yourself are um, unable to walk on your own or you know a neighbor who is, like um, the fire department was saying, now's the time to reach out to those neighbors and figure out not just one person, but who are several people that can look out for each other. Because I don't know how long that deputy you know, was able to stick around at that time before the fire moving 20 miles an hour overtook him. But um, as we'll talk about a little bit later, one of the main things that works um, really well down in that L.A. fire and worked well here is traditionally we just, like I said, when we go on these fires, we take our time, we knock on doors and we help people evacuate. And that's going to be, you know, 95, 99 percent of our evacuations. But in an instance like this, we have to use other things. And it might just be a car driving through your neighborhood with the sirens going full blast and we're on our PA shouting instructions. Because something moving that fast, that's about all you're going to have time to do. So it's just to scare you a little bit, but also just make you aware of some some harsh realities that really I think are, for the first time in my life, are kind of affecting me and hitting home. Um, moving on, there's I learned a lot from these fires because um, living in Petaluma, which I never had to evacuate, but I was put on what was called an advisory evacuation that first morning because I'm up against um, some open space near kind of one ridge away from all the bad fires in, uh, near the town of Sonoma. But there's three evacuation types they were using. And frankly, to be honest with you, I've always just kind of thought of it as, hey, you're either ev mandatory evacuated or you're not. Pay attention to the fire. They used this system and I really liked it and we've since adopted it and it's in our pamphlet and we'll talk about it. But there's three types of notifications you'll get from us. One is an ad, uh, advisory evacuation, a voluntary evacuation, or a mandatory evacuation. An advisory was really helpful for me because you're kind of on pins and needles on these big fires because they're a town away, but you see how fast they're moving and how quickly. And you go, do I need to evacuate? What do I need to do? And um, Petaluma put one of these out for my neighborhood. They were neighborhood specific and said, "You don't. we're not telling you you need to evacuate right now, but you know what? start getting a plan, gather your resources, consider packing your car. And that was kind of the kick in the butt I needed. We packed our car up, we gathered things. We were we didn't evacuate, but we were 100% ready to go within five minutes tops. And in a perfect scenario, this is what we'll use this type of notification because I think it's very beneficial. It gets, your, gets you in the right mindset when you need to be. Another one is voluntary evacuations. Um, a lot of people I work with who live in Roner Park had these. They weren't forced to evacuate um, that first day, but they were advised to. This is one where 
I can tell you personally, if I were to receive a voluntary evacuation, I would go. Why stick around and wait for that mandatory? You you can get out. You got your kid. You found the cat hiding under the bed. You know, you've got everything. It's time to go at that point. Um, mandatory or when we're basically saying you need to go now, we might not be coming back. We might not be able to. This is your one notice. Um, like I said, residents strongly urge to leave the area. And this is where you really just need to make that decision to go. Mandatory evacuations. This is when we're basically, if time permitted, we're knocking on your door, we're driving through, we're blasting these things. And um, you basically have to leave. If you decide to remain, there's no, um, there's no guarantee we're coming back. We might not be able to. And the fire might not be able to as well. We kind of want to leave before we get to this. Now, granted, these fires that started in L.A. over the night, it went instantly from people sound asleep to you know, mandatory evacuation right now. You know, it just depends on the scenarios. So let's talk about notification types. Who here is signed up for our Nixle? That's good. I'd say, you know, maybe a third, a half. I would hope everyone here, <laughs> either tonight or right now, signs up for Nixle. There's a couple ways to do it. You can uh, go to nixle.com and kind of go through this whole list and get exactly what you want and don't want. If you don't want to do that, you can right now take your phone out, text the number, where is it? 88, I think I got a pointer. And that wasn't a laser pointer. Um, 888-777. You text that number and then in the message line, just write down what your zip code is. So what I did during these fires is I was already signed up for Petaluma, but a lot was happening in Runner Park and I had a lot of friends and coworkers there. So the first, I just pulled my phone out, I texted it, just like that I was getting Runner Park Nixels as well. Now it can be a little overwhelming to get a bunch of these, so that's where you can go to the website and kind of fine tune what you want. I will tell you that we're modifying how we send things out. A lot of people were kind of turned off to Nixel because we were doing a lot of, um, and it wasn't just us, but it was the towns. We're doing a lot of road closure notifications and things like that. And people were getting texts. We were just finalized stopping that. Um, so if you get a text from us, it's basically going to be emergency information. Um, all our other stuff is still going to go in on Nixel, but that'll be email. So if you want to get those, you do need to go through the website. But those will be our citizen academies and things like that. Or we made an arrest the other day. Um, Nixel's kind of... It was super beneficial during these fires, maybe not that first night, but they lasted about 10 days. I lived through this with everyone else, and that was where we were getting the accurate information. It wasn't on Nextdoor. It wasn't on Facebook. We got a lot of false information through there. It was the government agencies pushing things through Nexel, and it was great because it was a text alert. You knew right away how fast it was moving and things like that. So I'd really encourage you to sign up for that. There's also a hyperlink on our website. Um, alert Marin. So Alert Marin is, I don't think we've personally ever used that for a fire, but we have used it for, um, we've had an incident, I think it was about a year ago, where we had a subject with a, a gun go into a neighborhood in Corte Madera on the streets. And uh, we were trying to locate him and it was pretty credible. And we sent out kind of a grid Alert Marin where everyone's um, landline phone rang and we advise them to lock their doors, lock their windows and shelter in place. This is going on. It's a great resource. It's also great for evacuations. I'd also encourage you to go to alert Marin and sign up your landline, whether it's blocked or not, will automatically get these emergency messages. But, um, if you're like me and you don't have a landline anymore, but you have like a voiceover internet protocol phone, it will not, you have to register that. Or if you don't have a landline, and you want to just register your cell phone, or even if you have a cell phone and a landline, you sign up for that. And regardless of where you are, you'll know what's going on in your neighborhood in an emergency. Um, is the web? I don't know if the website's up there. It's not. What is it, Tom? Okay, alertmarin.org. Once again, go to our website. You can just hyperlink it too. Um, I don't. Yeah, there's a. Uh, has anyone seen a fire handout? I haven't seen that. Um, I've got lots of handouts. Though. Um, before we go on to the wireless emergency alerts or WIA, this is kind of, if you've been following a lot of the news up in uh, Sonoma County, this is kind of the hot button thing with um, a lot was 
They said, this is a, a Wii alert. Has everyone here by a show of hands ever gotten an Amber alert on their phone? Okay. Yeah. Maybe it came at two in the morning and woke you up. Um, you know, it doesn't sound like a text. It's almost like an air raid on your phone. It gets your attention, right? In certain imminent life-threatening instances, uh, we have the ability through Marin County OES with their blessing to send these out. And there was some talk of whether or not um, Sonoma's OES should have sent one out that night. The yeah, Mendocino County did, Sonoma didn't. I'm reading now that um, during the Los Angeles fires, some of those counties at least sent some out too. But before I get into that, um, just backpedaling a little bit, if we talk about those types of evacuations, how will those come? Um, if it's an advisory evacuation, that really low level one, you'd be getting that probably, we'd be posting that through Nixle. We'd probably put it on our Twitter, our Facebook, and Nextdoor, okay? It's kind of that low level. We wouldn't be robocalling your house with an advisory. We certainly wouldn't be doing a WIA for that. Now, if we got a voluntary evacuation, that's where you're going to get the, the phone call at your house through Alert Marin. The WIA is kind of a last resort. That's when we have a mandatory coming into effect, and that's where we would be talking about sounding your phone. Um it's great that it lights up your phone. Uh, one thing I will say is it is possible to turn that off on your phone. So if you've done that, I know on at least my Apple iPhone, you do have the ability to turn off Amber Alerts, but leave that active. So if the Amber Alerts bug you, you have that option. But um, I would definitely leave that on because if that ever sounds, that is like the ultimate pay attention and do what we're telling you to do, okay? Um, I know the town manager talked about possibility of a siren or horn. That is a siren or horn. It's that level. Um, the one, some of the drawbacks with uh, the wireless emergency alert or WIA is we can't target it like we can. Obviously, Nixle, if you sign up, it's targeted to you. And Alert Marin, I think we can target it down to just even a side of a street. Correct, Tom? Yeah. So it's it's great. We use that a lot. This. We basically, correct me if I'm wrong on this, because I was talking to Chris Riley, but we basically activate a cell phone tower. And anyone whose phone is interacting with that cell phone tower, and it could be some weird skip far away, will get this alert. So it, it's a bleed over. If we were trying to notify, let's say, Christmas Tree Hill in Corte Madera, we'd probably get Mill Valley residents, Larchburg residents. I'm not sure. It would, it would go on. The one thing that's nice about it, though, unlike a, a siren or horn, is we can include a message. So we can say, you know, residents of Christmas Tree Hill or everyone who lives west of Corte Madera Avenue, mandatory evacuation, all other residents, voluntary or shelter in place. It gives us that option, which is huge because we have to make sure we don't have 10,000 people all jump in their cars and get on the road at once because it's bad enough just to commute time around here, right? So that's another thing we're dealing with. Um, once again, unique ringtone and vibration. There's some uh, reform going on right now at the federal level where they're going to force um, cell phone character, uh, carriers to allow us to do from a 90 character to a 360 character. So it can be a more detailed message. But either way, we'll be able to put something out. Um, once again, you've got to turn that on if you want to receive that alert. And then this, I'll just quickly, this emergency alert system, this is what we've all seen on uh, the television at midnight when we were younger, right? This is a test of the emergency alert system. It's not going to help you too much. That's more, I think, used in earthquakes. I remember that as when I was younger during the Loma Prieta, that was really activated. It might have been activated during Oakland Hills. I'm not sure. But a um, little bit older technology. Okay, evacuation procedures. I told you I wasn't going to spend a ton of time on this because they're incredibly fluid. I can't tell you exactly how um, me and Captain Khalili and your fire department would evacuate any of your neighborhoods because depending on whether it's an earthquake, a fire, wind direction, um, exactly what's burning, we could completely be changing that route. A lot of people say, could you come to my neighborhood and tell me which way we would evacuate? Well, we can't tell you that because it might drastically change on a lot of factors. Um, what I can tell you is what we generally, tell me if I'm getting too quiet too, it, what we generally do is time permitting, we really strive for that personal contact. We try to knock on all the doors. Um, if you're disabled, we try to help you out and get you out and everything goes smoothly. In some of these Tubbs fires, Los Angeles fires, you can see that's not a reality to have that personal contact. But 
There is the vehicle loudspeaker and sirens. Um, all I would say to that, I think pretty much everyone here, if you heard a siren going down your street, you kind of are paying attention anyways, because it's, it's interesting, it's exciting. And if you hear an officer yelling on a PA, you're probably going to listen. But that would be, uh, in a really large, fast-moving fire, maybe the best we could do in terms of personal contact. The bottom line is listen to our directions, whether it's a, you know, a telephone call, whether it's your phone, getting a text through that WIA, or it's us yelling through the speaker. Listen to what we're saying, follow those directions, and don't hesitate. Get out when you can. Um, if you don't believe me, read some of the, uh, the personal stories of people who made it and whose loved ones didn't from the uh, Sonoma County fires. It's truly heartbreaking, and it's, it's really quite terrifying, to be honest with you. Um, just a little, uh, one of our better pictures, we did go up to, we were deployed as a, since we're closest to Sonoma, up to Sonoma County, we were up there for about 10 days. It wasn't just the firefighters. We had four to six officers up there 24 seven for four days. Some of our officers actually did get a great experience of getting to live participate in real evacuations because even after that first day, they had to do a ton more evacuations because they couldn't get a handle on it. It was so big. So we do have some firsthand experience. They did also a lot of security, but in the background behind our car, I'm not sure if that's Mark West or uh, Fountain Grove area. Fountain Grove, I mean, you can just see it's absolutely devastating. Finally, um, here's some of our social media. If you're interested in signing for that, up that for that as well, and our websites at the bottom. I do want to just make a comment on a personal experience with Twitter, Facebook, and Nextdoor during the fires is I was probably getting a Nixle alert from either Petaluma or and or Runner Park twice a day saying there are no evacuation orders in place. And at first I go, oh, that's good. That's interesting. And then I started realizing why they were doing this is people on social media, for whatever reason, hopefully it was good intentions, were saying, hey, I just heard we have to evacuate this whole part of Petaluma in 30 minutes. There's a lot of misinformation going on. It was not coming from any government resources. And so they had to get in front of it and say, no, 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 no. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. Um, so do not rely on even well-intentioned citizens during um, on social media. Listen to what we'll be putting out a lot during it, whether it's me or Margo or Marin OES. Um, listen to what we're saying. That's, that's where we're at right now. And um, one other thing I did want to just point out, because it made me think of it, of, uh, I think, I'm not sure which of you guys, there's so many of you talking, but one of you was talking about getting a, uh, like a go bag or a fire bag ready to go. I don't, uh, it's kind of embarrassing, but I don't have that. But we have some supplies kind of in our garage in one area, and we have a bucket filled with some stuff. So we grabbed that in the morning, and we put it in the car. And I'm like, you know, if this is going to be a long thing, we should probably get some more water. My wife's car was at like a third tank full. Um, I was dealing with the pets. I'm like, hey, just shoot down to the gas station, get some gas and grab some water. So this was at 8 a.m. the night after that fire. We're in Petaluma. We're not anywhere near Santa Rosa. She went out. Everyone from Santa Rosa had come south to either Petaluma or Novato. I'd say maybe half our gas stations were out of gas already. And the other half, she said, just had like, like hour waits. So she's like, I'm not even going to bother. We had another car that was gassed up. So that was fine. And then she stuck her head in the supermarket. <laughs> Empty. Water's gone. I mean, it just it just goes to show you how important it is to be prepared. And you know what? It doesn't hurt to have twice as much water as you need. I mean, what? It doesn't go bad. So that's just kind of my, my little plug that I, you should probably listen to the firefighters. And um, with that. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Tom Jordan with uh, Marin OES. Thank you, Chief Norton. And uh, you've, you've called out here the ratio of firefighters um, to law enforcement. So I want to clearly state to everyone here that uh, while the Office of Emergency Services in the County of Marin is stewarded by the Sheriff's Office and in other counties, it's a function of the County Fire Department or the Administrator's Office. So in case there's a wrestling match later on, I don't want to get in the middle of it. Uh, please, please make note of that, all the firefighters here in the front row staring at me. Um, I want to talk uh, a little bit about our alert notification system, and I want to speak about a few specific topics. Uh, initially, I'd like to speak about opt-ins 
and the importance of going to our um, opt-in self-registration portal, which is at www.alertmarin.org, and registering um, to receive alerts um, through that opt-in system. Uh, many years ago, uh, most homes had a landline, and I don't mean the phone that kind of looks like a landline, but I mean the one that actually goes through the phone company and not through a VoIP type of a provider. Um, those phone systems, those plain old telephone system, phone systems are going away. They've become cost prohibitive for some households. Other folks uh, see it as a, as a duplication when they already have their mobile phone, which they're using. And that puts us at a disadvantage when we're trying to do an alert notification for a specific geographic area. So I just wanted to really encourage you all um, to, to really look at this, the, the opt-in numbers that we have here. Uh, we've got 1,800 um, for the area, but if you'll look at the number of residents, uh, we're not really at a, we don't really have as good attraction as we need to have. So I realize that most of you through uh, being proactive and, and attending this presentation are most likely signed in. So this message is not for you. Um, this message is for your neighbor. Um, this, this message is for your friend, your family member, who maybe has not opted in for whatever reason. Um, if it's a technical proficiency issue, please assist them with that. Um, offer to help them sign in, walk them through the process. If it's just confusion about what exactly that means to opt in, we have a frequently asked questions element to the web page and to the self-registration portal, which is intended to really clearly address any uh, questions folks might have about why or why not um, to opt in. This is just a little um, graphic. It's a screenshot that I took from our alert notification system. And those dots indicate homes um, that have opted in in one form or another. Uh, we talked a little bit about area-wide um, notifications and the distinction between that and notifying just one area um, of the town. And, and here is another screen grab where what I did was I drew a polygon um, over the map uh, in a scenario where we might want to specifically notify folks in a given neighborhood about an incident. Maybe this is a shelter in place, uh, law enforcement sort of scenario, or maybe it's an evacuation um, due to a utility disruption or a fire or something else um, in, the, in the area. So what that kind of looks like when we determine what area to draw on a polygon is that it really starts with the field. So the firefighter or the law enforcement officer whose incident command or the IC for a given incident will call um, our county communication center and they'll ask that an OES duty officer be paged for the purpose of issuing an alert. We then call that incident commander directly on the phone and we speak with them to identify a few parameters. Um, initially, when we want to kind of put a box around it. So could you give us some cross streets and, and let us kind of know the area um, that you want us to notify. Then we talk about specifically What's the message? Is this a shelter in place? Is this an evacuation? We have many templates that we've established so we can prompt that incident commander uh, to go ahead and make sure in the most expeditious manner we get the verbiage correct um, for the alert warning. At that point, um, we go ahead, we prepare the map, we prepare the message that's going to go out. And we actually, as we activate that, the very first call that goes is to the incident commander who made the request so that they real time can hear the alerts coming out and they know that their message um, was as, as they phrased it and going to the community that they wanted to. Um, from that point forward, we stay in communication with the incident commander, try and stay out of their hair. But what we also want to do is know as soon as possible when the disposition of that incident is to a point where we need to do a follow-up notification. Hopefully it's an all clear sort of thing. Um, how to opt in, it was mentioned, uh, it's just going to kind of keep repeating this, www.alertmarin.org. Uh, it's a very straightforward, no cost process. And um, when you go to uh, the website, you'll notice that we have uh, not only information on how to register for an emergency alert, but we also have um, information uh, called the View Current Emergency Info. And what that allows you to do is see some of our feeds. Um, these feeds here are from um, our, you know, our, our social media accounts, which we might use for a community message or an advisory. Um, but of course, as it was stated earlier, we really reserve the alert system for an actual disaster. We do not want to tell you that the you know, Black Friday deal is going on or, or that the roadway out to Point Reyes, Bolinas, something like that. It's, gonna, it's really these are actionable life safety messages that we use the system for solely.
Um, with that, um, I'd like to introduce Captain Cindy Machado. She's with the uh, Marine Humane, and uh, she'll talk to you about animals and disasters and how to be prepared for them. So welcome everybody. It's so great to see so many of you here on a topic like this. I've been at Marine Humane for 33 years and this is like a dream come true to see so many people involved in wanting to learn about preparedness. So thank you for having me and thank you for having a little component about animals. And I know it's about 7.30 so I'll make this really quick. So why do we want to plan for animals? Um, for starters, let me just ask, how many of you have furry companions at home? As I expected, pretty much every everybody, and those of you that don't, you still love animals too, I'm sure. So um, these are the main reasons. They're part of our family. Gone are the days where the dog was out in the backyard. Now the dog is on our bed, on our couch, watching our favorite TV shows, as well as our cats and other animals. But it's really more important to plan to, to have animals as part of this plan so they don't become an even worse plan for first responders. You saw the roads, you saw the fire concerns. The last thing we want is you to be endangering your life for the, that of your animal. So the message is the more we can plan for our animals, the more you're going to be prepared. So um, having said that, I've seen my share of impacts on animals and just came from, I live in Sonoma Valley, the opposite ridge of wherever he was, it was in Petaluma. Um, and these things spread quickly. There's very little time to prepare, so we want as much planning in advance of a disaster. So I'm going to be really promoting all of you that have animals to have a pet disaster kit. So everything that your animal will need, for we used to say three-day period, now we're going to say a week to two weeks. I was without power for eight days, which meant no power, no water. And as you can imagine, I have a household of animals. So everything your pet needs for its comfort and safety, I want you to pack up so that it's ready to go out the door when you get that advisory message. Don't wait until the mandatory, especially if you have animals. And pack up everything you might need. There's so many great examples. In fact, you can actually buy a pet disaster kit online. You can go to the earthquake store, or you can create your own. And the more you have um, these items in advance, the easier it's going to be not only for you, but for your pet and for me, because I'll probably be, be in a position to take care of your pets for you. Um, this information is all over the internet, um, all the way up to the American Veterinary Medical Association. There are checklists, there are information sheets you can take advantage of. You can check with your veterinarian, see if they can provide you with information. And even the Center for Disease Control now has information that you can retreat easily at the click of a button. So, what can we do as a neighborhood? And I'm so excited to see that you guys are so prepared block by block. I want you to incorporate the animal component into your block planning. Please, please, please. So, same thing. Who are the animals in the neighborhood? Who's, it's not that big Rottweiler, it's the little tiny Chihuahua that sometimes we're more fearful of. And someone earlier said the cat under the bed. How did you know that? That's exactly where they go. If they're not under your bed, they're in your closet or under that piece of um, furniture that you can't move. So know that in advance. Know who's probably not going to be around. A lot of commuters in Marin. Who's going to take care of the household that has the pets that are waiting uh, for their person to come home from after work. Who knows where a key is? Who knows um, what their needs are? So we want you to identify all of these things well in advance of a disaster, especially a fire. Where are your pets going to go in a disaster? Um, that's always the big question. Um, if you're home and you're there to evacuate, we really want you to remove your animals with you at that moment. Don't assume that you're going to be able to come back to your house after you evacuate. Take them with you. What happened up in Sonoma County, we spent weeks up there sheltering in place animals that were left behind that people couldn't get back to. So we don't want that to be reality. Um, are there going to be injuries? Are there going to be special needs that we need to take care of? Will we have enough water? Trust me, you said double the water. I say quadruple the water. 
because that became my biggest dilemma trying to bring water back to my pets. Um, there was no water even in the Nevada Safeway. So plan for these things. Um, the other thing that we really like to encourage you to have is have an out of area contact. And delegate someone to be your emergency contact person so that we might not be able to get in touch with you because your cell phone's down or you're not at your home. Your contact person, person can act on your behalf for your pet. Um, the other big thing we're really trying hard to work on in this county is to get every veterinary hospital to have a disaster plan. We only have one out of the 42 hospitals in this county that actually has a plan, if you can believe that. So when you take your pet to the veterinarian for anything, the groomer, the uh, pet supply, whatever, ask them, what is the plan for my pet should there be a disaster today? That's going to indirectly help me put a little bit of, no pun intended, fire under them to uh, get a plan for your pet. Because we've seen that uh, that happened in Sonoma County. Um, one veterinary hospital burned to the ground. Um, where do we take those client animals? And then making sure that you have um, all of the disaster supplies specifically for your animal is really helpful. Um, identifying your pet. Right now, up in Sonoma County, there's over 700 lost cats that we're trying desperately to work with our colleagues up there to reunite. But it starts with being able to identify them. Um, whether it's a cat or a dog, I want you to have a dog license, I want you to have a microchip, I want you to have an owner ID tag, because that gives your pet 98% more of a time to get re reunited back with you, which is our goal in the disaster. Um, they should be wearing their collars and tags, and it should be easy for anyone to read. So be mindful of that. Other thing is crate train your pets. Um, if they are afraid of going into a carrier or having to live in a carrier, that's going to be a problem for us because during a, a big disaster, it's going to be all about living in crates. So this is an actual real life example. Uh, during the Sonoma County fires, our shelter became an evacuation center for all um, pets from evacuees. At one time, we were serving over 103 families, had over 500 animals within our shelter, closed all business altogether. So we would do that in a heartbeat um, in a disaster in Marin. The other thing that's good to know is I sit at Tom's place at the County Emergency Oper Operations Center. We actually have a separate animal services function. So I'm leading all of the animal coordination throughout the entire county, your cities, etc. cetera. Um, and we're gonna make plans about getting resources in, whether that's equipment, supplies, staffing. This is a snapshot view of what happens in a big disaster. This is how we set animals up. So it's, um, it's not fancy, it's not spacious, but it's safe. It's temporary and it's safe. And so put your dog or your cat in this photo and kind of understand what the obstacles will be. But um, th this is a lot of coordination. And we, like the fire and law, are going to be relying on mutual aid, just as we provide mutual aid across the country during disasters for the animal response. We will ask our colleagues to come in and help us. So the four main groups that we would call on today are the ASPCA, the Humane Society of the United States, Code 3, and North Valley Disaster Group. All of these are separate nonprofits uh, that do really good stuff on the disaster response front. And our bottom line in any disaster is always to reunite your animal back to you. So never for, uh, forget to report them lost. Never give up. The Oakland fires, we made magic happen uh, a year after many pets had been lost. Same thing's going to be true in Sonoma County. Animals find their way into magical situations where um, it becomes joyous when you can reunite uh, pets back to their families. And that's my information. I will also be happy to do any more in-depth animal training. And we're going to quickly turn it back to someone else for the questions. For uh, time's sake, I know we're about 10 minutes over, but I just wanted to give everyone an opportunity to once again thank our presenters for uh, taking the time to put this on for you.
and also and also an opportunity for you to ask us some specific questions um, that we haven't addressed yet. Um, but I like to keep it to about 10 minutes. Um, but I promise you one thing, that after the 10 minutes, um, all the presenters will be over here and you'll be able to interact with them and ask them any questions. So anybody have any questions? Curious from a fire standpoint, how are coast live oaks? How far fire resistant are they? Or are they very dangerous? Okay, so the question was, um, how well do oak trees uh, do a fire? Actually, oak trees actually do really well. Um, the type of species aren't the real. What we're worried about is more your live or your fine fuels like. Um, Think about smaller leaves, smaller twigs, and so forth. Um, oak trees will tend to survive depending on the amount of fire that they get. Oak trees aren't our number one concern in a wildfire. Following up, is there a more general source of information of what trees and shrubs are particularly pyrophytic? Yes, there is. Um, we have... Um, uh, Fire Safe Marin would be an excellent uh, website to uh, refer to. Um, another one would be um, we've got our vegetation management plan that talks about um, what plants should not be used within a certain area. So within that 30 feet or what we call the most pyrophytic. Within the county of Marin, we've got 25 species of plants that we consider that you should not plant. And um, we'll get those resources to you. Hi there. Um, my son just started White Hill Middle School in Fairfax, and um, I've been very concerned about um, the location of the school, considering that it's in a canyon. And um, I've been inquiring as to what the evacuation plan is if there is a wildfire uh, in that area. And I have not been able to get an answer yet, so I'm hoping uh, one of you could address that. Sure. So I can answer that. Um... I, prior to starting with Central Marin, I was actually the fire inspector for the San Anselmo or Ross Valley area, which covered Fairfax. Um, once again, the evacuation routes, it's all dependent on where the fire is, what the emergency is. In a wildland fire, everything's very fluid and dynamic. Um, your best resource would be for emergency preparedness, would be the Ross Valley Unified School District to see what the school is doing and also contact the Ross Valley Fire Department directly and they'll be able to assist you there. Um, that again, it depends on where the fire is. And so if the fire's coming from West Marin, we're probably gonna get all the students within buses, whether it's school buses, um, Golden Gate Transit, whatever we can, and we're probably going to start going eastbound, getting them towards Highway 101. It's going to be um, traffic, as you know, is difficult with the commute. We're going to do everything we possibly can with both Central Marine Police, Fairfax Police, to try to uh, alleviate some of that traffic. And, and it may be possible to open up all four lanes, and, and it all depends on how big the event is and how many people we need to evacuate. All of this information tonight has been wonderful and very helpful, but the main question I have, since uh, many of us here live in Madrone Canyon, where the trees touch each other at the top, our only escape route, only escape route is the creek, which is filled with debris, trees that are fallen down, and one of our neighbors contacted um, the Conservation Corp, and they said now. They just let everything be natural. Well, we have only one way out. There aren't two ways to get out of Madrone. We can't drive. We have to walk down to the creek. There are large rocks there. Is there a plan that we could implement? Um, are you aware of it? The second part of my question is now in Madrone, there's a tremendous amount of road work being done. The men smoke. 
You see them with a cigarette dangling and the ashes falling off. I spoke to the foreman. He just shrugged his shoulders. I called the fire department who said, we don't have an ordinance to prevent that. So all of us in Madrone are at risk. So we need your help. Yes. I'll start with the um, evacuation plan from Madrone Canyon. And uh, like you say, there is only one way in and out of there. So the biggest message the fire department would say about that would be early evacuation would be the best thing possible. And one thing I meant, I forgot to mention that I wanted to mention is that uh, the Twin Cities area have begun to develop a lot of NRGs, which are neighborhood response groups. And I urge you to participate in the neighborhood response group because those groups are assisting people with the, uh, man uh, the, the voluntary evacuations. At the point when it's mandatory, it's a little more of just get yourself out. But prior to the mandatory evacuations, when we're still in the voluntary ones, are when these neighborhood response groups are able to assist people and maybe even uh, know which residents are unable to evacuate themselves. But again, that, that's a very challenging situation with Drone Canyon. It's not like Christmas Tree Hill where there's other ways to go out. There's one way in and one way out. So the message from the fire department would be at, at the voluntary evacuation point would be the time to get out. It's, this, I actually have never heard that question. It's, it's a very good one. Um, we don't consider the creek as, as a primary evacuation route, personally. We, as Battalion Chief Reese mentioned, our plan is to get as much notice as we can out and try and prevent incoming traffic other than emergency responders and get as many people out through the roadway system as we can. We realize that it's going to be a challenge and I imagine that you realized that it was going to be a challenge, too. When you bought your home in that community, it's a beautiful, beautiful setting. And it's very difficult to get in and out on an average day. Um, when we have a situation where we have to get everybody out quickly, it's going to be a challenge. And that's why we want everybody to be prepared and to not delay when the time comes. As far as the um, cigarette smoking issue, I am not personally aware of any communities that have enacted a no smoking ordinance on a public street. I mean, it's, I, I agree with your concern, but um, it's just something that I, I, I can't imagine enacting some kind of an ordinance where people were not allowed to smoke on a public street. Um, Berkeley, you can't smoke on the... Interesting. Okay, well... Um, Certainly we can look into that. Um, it's not fire department's responsibility generally to um, create the laws. We can encourage it and, and pursue it. But um, fortunately okay. with the cigarette, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, one of the issues with smoking in an area that's prone to fires is the lack of education of what the danger is. So my job as a fire marshal is to go out and educate these people on what the hazard is and what the hazard isn't. So if you say that there's people smoking in an area that's maybe prone to wildfires, I'd be more than happy to go out and try to educate this person and with the hopes to try to change that human behavior, which sometimes can be difficult, but at least with the education, maybe they'll think twice before lighting that cigarette in the wild interface. Inter inter but like Chief Shirt said, um, it's kind of hard to regulate people on public streets when, if there is no smoke, uh, a smoking ordinance. Yes, and I agree with you. And it's same with people flicking cigarettes out of their cars. I see it all the time. It's that same hazard. It's um, being uneducated of the hazard. Okay. Uh, for time's sake, one last question. I've done two on this side. Is this, uh, how about here? I'm a Christmas tree hill dweller. My question is two. Um, First, if we see cars that are parked outside the white line spaces and it's after hours for the police department, what do we do? Who do we report it to? Will it be effective to report it? And will somebody come and either ticket or remove the car? 
That's part one. Can I do part two? Okay. Uh, to answer your question about parking in, in those areas where it's controlled on the street within the, uh, the white painted areas, um, we're a 24 seven police agency. So you could call us at two o'clock in the morning and there'll be officers available to, to respond. Uh, yes. Uh, our regular business line, uh, 415-927-5150. Give us a call. We will come out regardless of the time of day or night. Uh, the first one's a, a citation and it increases from there. Second question with, um, recalcitrant neighbors, I would call them. Um, I have neighbors who have scotch broom, who have various, um, very flammable plants. Mm -hmm. If I can't sort of sweet talk them into doing something, is there anything I can do? I, I don't really want to call the police or, I mean, as so, call the fire department. Yeah. So the best thing is, um, call the fire department and I would go out or one of the engine companies will come out and do a drive by. And if we see a hazard, we'll write a hazard notice and have the property cleared. All right. So at this point, thank you. At this point, I think what we're going to do is we're going to stick around. We'll be kind of spread all over. Um, there's fire and police here. There's humane. There's Marin OES. If you have any more questions, just come up to us one-on-one and we'll answer them to the best of our abilities. Thank you all for coming.